Who am I? Richard Casimer, media veteran. Why I got in radio is because I'm good with a knife. Contributor in Perth, Australia. Our friend Richard Casimer in the United States. Uh, how are you guys enjoying the 19th century? Is that working out for you? How can you say, I'm not making fun of you as a race, I'm making fun of you as black performers? I think as a country, Americans are as patriotic as the most rabid UK football hooligan. Who am I? Richard S. Casimer. Balls Radio with Phil Dobby. We've got the case here. We haven't spoken about it on the program yet, but it has been in the news. The case of a South Korean woman who's lived here for eight years. She was the fiancé of an Australian. She's got a four-year-old daughter, and we have sent her back, basically. Sent her back to South Korea because her relationship broke down. Uh, She was here on a fiancé visa, and basically... The government has said, well, you know, terms of the uh, of the visa have expired. Off you go. You've got the grandfather of this four year old daughter who's as Aussie as you can be, uh, who all of a sudden now loses a granddaughter who has to return overseas with uh, uh, with his with her mother. It's a tragic case. I mean, uh, and I think the government is doing themselves a disservice uh, because uh, this is the sort of human interest story that people are interested in. But meanwhile, in the United States, Barack Obama has called on Homeland Security to be a little more lenient on the deportation of immigrants who are in the U.S. illegally if they've got no other criminal convictions, uh, particularly when you've got cases like this where you've got uh, somebody who's been born in the country who is a U.S. citizen. So how has that been received uh, over there? Is it, uh, are people supporting uh, his move to be a little bit more lenient? Well, we'll see. You know, for a country whose entire existence was founded on the settlement of immigrants from the original Native Americans to the Vikings, the Europeans, Asians, African, South America, and beyond. It's no surprise that we find ourselves in this paradoxical pickle of having to deport people who are in this country illegally based on generations of saying, come on over, this is the land of opportunity. And what's happening is that President Obama has made a vow to make deportations more humane out of concern of the children of illegal immigrants, many of who the parents have been here for 10 years or more, and the kids are entrenched in school, and the kids have been born here, which then ought automatically makes them U.S. citizens. So we are seeing cases where parents are being deported, but the kids are remaining here in foster care or with other relatives that may have entered this country legally. Right. And so, it, again, it's not unusual for parents to be deported while the child who was a U.S. citizen remains here until those parents are able to come back. So but, we'll see what happens. But I'm sure there are people who are saying, well, you know, he's he's wrong to do this and we should be deporting because otherwise it opens the floodgates. It sounds like they're already open anyway. Uh, the, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of people on the hard right who are happy to break up families just to, uh, as a point of principle in terms of maintaining the uh, immigration laws. You would think, but not necessarily no. because this is a political wedge issue. And by the way, President Obama has deported over 2 million illegal immigrants during his administration. Two, and that's more than any... Two, two million. million. That's, that's more than any other president. And that's much to the consternation of Latino voters who represent the majority of the illegal immigrants and also represent the largest minority voting bloc who predominantly vote uh, Democrat. Are you sure so you've got that? Is two concern. million? Are you sure you've Absolutely. got that? You're not putting yes. in a couple of extra zeros? How no. the hell do you deport? I mean, that's... Uh, the number of aircraft it would take to deport two million people for a start is just uh, monumental. Well, what you do is you tell them you've got to get out of the country and then they they hop a bus or whatever and they, and they leave they don't pack them into the airplanes and haul them over the border right. they are told to leave the country and they have a certain amount of time to leave or go to jail now getting back to the right versus the left on this this falls under that political wedge of immigration reform the democrats and president obama for the most part would be in favor of some sort of automatic citizenship based on the time the people have been here so again some people have been here for generations or some sort of uh, self-deportation, which is unrealistic. What you do is you tell people, either go through the legal channels or you need to get out of here in a certain amount of time or we will deport you or put you in jail. The Republicans are always screaming for immigration reform. However, they do absolutely nothing because the Republicans are pro-big business who are the major benefactor of illegal immigrants here who are working 
under the radar. They work for less than minimum wage in terrible conditions, and they are threatened with being reported to uh, immigration officials if they don't kowtow to, to these business owners. So that's not right, is it? So so you think no. that it's, you think that, that is the reason why it's nothing out of uh, uh, any sense of uh, welfare for fellow human beings. The, the Republicans are there saying, well, we support big business and this is what big business wants. They want to... Uh, they want to uh, basically employ slave labor. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and at the same time saying that the president and the Democrats are doing nothing to stop the flood of illegal immigrants that are coming in here. They'll always say, too, that the illegal immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans, and they are not. They're doing the jobs that Americans don't do. do. Yeah. You know, the lower paying service industry, custodial work, uh, you know, daycare, things like that. And they do pay taxes. Now, it's another thing that the right will say is that we've got to get rid of them because they don't pay taxes. Of course, they pay taxes. They take their money, and anytime they buy anything here in the United States, there's a sales tax on it. If they have cars, they and they put gas in their car, there's a gas tax and everything else. So they do pay taxes. So what has been the motivation then for the president to, to deport two million people during his, uh, his couple of terms in office? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. He, he's doing something. He's a proactive president. He doesn't always toe the, the liberal or the left-leaning line. He's more of a, a moderate Democrat than he is of progressive so he's following the laws as they apply maybe yeah. seeing the light a little bit now and uh, it, it involves splitting up families and it's it's uh, th- there's a, a long history within the country uh, he's starting to wonder whether that was actually the smart move so at least uh, at least he's seen the light i guess now uh, moving on to another contentious issue here george brandis uh, keen to get rid of uh, who's our attorney general keen to get rid of section 18c of the racial discrimination act because of course uh, in a in a free country, you should be able to say something insulting and revolting about a person based on their ethnicity. And uh, if they're insulted or offended, well, you know, that's just free speech. Uh, in other words, you know, we're saying, let Andrew Bolt write what the hell he wants. Now, what's, what's the situation in the United States? Because, I mean, Fox News similarly gets away with a lot. What, uh, what's the attitude towards free speech versus basically insulting people and, uh, and vilifying people over there? Unlike you folks, our freedom of speech is protected in the Constitution of the United States. The only provision of protection of speech in your Constitution is Section 18C, which says that you can't discriminate against ethnic groups. What we do is we can say pretty much whatever the hell we want on the air, short of the seven dirty words, which is why we've had such a long history of this vitriolic, hate-mongering, race-baiting right-wing radio, which, by the way, you would not have had you not uh, emulated our right-wing radio for so many years. Yeah. But you can say what you want that's the, you. You. You're talking. You collectively, Australia, yes, not yes, me. Because yes. I, okay, no, I would and hate you, to think that I've. Phil, I'm emulating right wing talk you, radio for the United lo- States. You, you know I love you, buddy. <laughs> well, that's, so that's, 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 that's just a, a, that's just a rumor that's getting out. By the way, I anyway, mean there, yeah, there is there is the, there is the thing about the, the the freedom of speech. It doesn't protect somebody uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater. You can't have a speech that calls people to incite t- to go out and do violent things. But there is a fine line between. Between that, the line is blurred on the protection of freedom of speech and what constitutes hate speech. And there aren't any laws, really, that they're very vague, if they exist at all, on how to uh, actually enforce that. However, the difference is, let's say a, ra- a radio a presenter, a talk show on a right-wing program, should this presenter say something that the owner of that radio station disagrees with, that radio presenter can be fired immediately with no recourse. They are not protected under the freedom of speech because that person can say what they want, but not necessarily at the expense of their employer. If that radio presenter or anybody goes out on the public street and says what they want, that's their business. But if they say it in a business situation and the owner or the program director says, you know what, you don't represent this station or our listeners, you're gone regardless of the contract. Now, you see, I'm not sure I'm, I, I have a problem with that. What I have provided, that, that, that what we're talking about is a free and open market where you have a, where you have a lot of media. The problem we've got in this country is we're, we're quite a small country. And so the, uh, by and large, the radio industry uh, or the electronic media and TV channels are exactly the same, are protected. You know, we don't like, allow new entrants in because the, the government controls the number of licenses that are issued, partially because of Spectrum. But these days, that argument is disappearing because there's, uh, the, there's more Spectrum digital 
spectrum that's been uh, been opened out, but no new entrants allowed in. So, um, so, so in my mind, that means that uh, you do need to closely guard what is said on those channels because it's not free and open competition. So you can't treat it as that. In the United States, you've got a lot more choice, I guess. So perhaps the ability for people to, uh, for, for owners to take a little bit more editorial control may be an issue, but not as big an issue as where you've got a constrained market. Well, what happens is it affects the bottom line, which is the advertising dollar. If you have advertisers, well, first off, if you have listeners saying, I will not listen to your station, therefore I will not visit uh, your your advertisers, that hits their pocket. And you've yeah. seen that in Australia as well, just yet- this past year happening to some talk show hosts who have lost advertisers in droves because the listeners complain. Uh, and yet, I mean, <laughs> they're still strangely in this country and in the united states they're popular people so people like alan jones has got a large share of the sydney radio audience uh rush limbaugh you know uh right wing uh, shock jock in the united states uh is syndicated across the country and must have millions of listeners however when you look at the demographics the same thing with jones mr laws limbaugh sean hannity over here the dominant demographic they have is 65 plus, not 25, 54, which is the key demographic. So when you have people who are listening that, and that, and that are 65 to death, those people are on a fixed income. They're sedentary. They don't buy cars. They don't buy homes. So they are not the advertising attraction. So there's a big no, difference and, between your you know high ratings of a 65 plus uh, demographic and a high rating with somebody that's a 25, 54. Old and they're losing their minds, uh, basically sums up the audience pretty well, doesn't it? Uh, Let's move on. (laughs) A man has been freed from death row in Louisiana after 26 years based on new evidence. Thank goodness they didn't rush through with a death sentence and they uh, kept him hanging on there for 26 years. And then the man is free. Does this sort of thing happen a lot? It does more than you would think. You know, just getting back to Mr. Ford, he was in Angola prison in Louisiana, which is a terrible, terrible prison for 30 years for a crime he didn't commit. He was convicted of shooting a watchmaker to death in a robbery. Well, as Lynn found out uh, recently that an informant came out and told prosecutors that someone else did the murder. What's, What's terrible in this case is that there was never any murder weapon found. There were no witnesses. He was implicated by a woman who later testified that she lied, yet the jury handed out a murder conviction and they recommended the death sentence. Of course, the fact that Mr. Ford is an African-American couldn't possibly have had anything to do with his wrongful conviction. And he an gets all-white out, jury. An yeah, all-white jury. Exactly. He gets out and, bless his heart, he's got his head on straight and he's going to get on with his life. He could get a substantial amount of money out of this for wrongful conviction and wrongful incarceration. The original prosecutors could appeal any reward that he's going to get because they could say, well, you know, he still might have had something to do with it, even though he's been completely exonerated. Now, last year alone, getting back to your point, uh, there were 87 exonerations in the United States, 1,304 from 1989 to February 3rd of this year. And it's all based on new CSI technology in cases where the re-examination of physical evidence applies, where now they can do DNA testing on blood samples, on clothing that are decades and decades old. So that's a good thing. And and there's a lot of people over here who are doing things, mostly universities, law universities. Your folks can jump on a website. There's a joint project by the University of Michigan Law School and a center on wrongful convictions at Northwestern University School of Law. They've got a website called the National Registry of Exonerations, and it has some brilliantly detailed information on U.S. exoneration cases. So hopefully we'll see more people in these convictions overturned these folks that have and, been there wrongfully convicted. And I guess it has to be people like that who are who are tackling these because the police would be using this new technology to try and solve the crimes that haven't been crimed, uh, that haven't been solved rather than going back on the ones that they think are, are done and dusted. Exactly. Once a criminal has been convicted or a suspect has been convicted, it's really out of the police hands. They don't go back and try to, and it's not their job. It's not their job to go and find somebody innocent who has been convicted. Now, we see a lot of movies Movies that will do that, or even TV shows where someone goes back and digs up maybe a cold case file, or somebody that they, you know, a relative came and say, "Hey, can you help out my relative who's I believe they were wrongly convicted?" They just don't do it. You have to go to the legal profession, whether they are law students or, or something like that, to, to do it. And again, there are several groups in this country that have been doing it for for some time now and uh, with a good success rate. So I, I said he was on death row. I mean, I don't know. Is that the correct term? Does that 
that mean at some yes. point? If so, if he hadn't been found, uh, if he hadn't been exonerated, would he have uh, been at some point been killed? Well, he'd been sitting there for almost thirty years. Now there were thirty. Yeah, why? There were why? thirty-two states in this in the United States that have capital punishment. However, once you're convicted and once you're sentenced to death, that doesn't mean per se that you're going to face the gas chamber or uh, lethal injection immediately. What usually happens is that the lawyer will file an appeal and then other groups can come out and file appeal after appeal after appeal and hold up the court system, hold up the death sentence for decades. And that's usually what happens. And a lot of times the governor of the state will say, well, you know, uh, even though we have a death penalty here, uh, we're not really comfortable about using it. And so that's what happens. But uh, appeals can last for uh, the life of a prisoner in a lot of cases. Do you think some people will change their mind now on capital punishment if they see that uh, you know that increasingly we're finding more and more cases where the uh, someone has been wrongly accused uh, and sentenced. Uh, could s- some people change their attitude towards it, or are pretty people pretty hardline on this? They are pretty hardline. It's a real hot and cold issue. Unless you live in a state where capital punishment is there, it's really out of sight, out of mind. You really don't know. And and someone who who could let's say there's a murderer who's caught in Massachusetts, for example, they can then be extradited to another state because we don't have the death penalty. So they can be extradited to another state if that person committed a crime, let's say another murder in another state, to be executed there. So the state could say, well, okay, well, we'll wash our hands of this whole thing. The prosecutor could say, okay, we, you you take them because we know he's going to get the gas chamber or the electric chair in this other state. It's a non-voting issue. They rarely come up on referendum. So I think that it's, it's just a status quo right now. Yeah, it sounds to me that something out of the uh, out of the Middle Ages, though. You know, the state sanctioned uh, killing of citizens. I just, I just, I just can't understand. Can't get my head around it at all. But we have, but, you we, know, that- we have more prisoners in this country than any other country in the world, and, and not just yeah. death row inmates, and not just hardcore. We have more people in the penal system than any other country in the world, and it's and something has to be done. Does that mean you start clearing out death row <laughs> and giving them the death penalty to clear? it out i don't know that's that's gonna get through them quicker it's awful isn't it i don't know why it's a discussion for another time as to why you have more incarcerated but very i'm sure the police would say we're just so efficient at our jobs that's why uh, we catch more uh finally uh south by southwest this festival in austin texas which i've only become aware of in the last few years and largely because the the interactive industry uh the digital industry sort of uh use it as a bit to a bit of a get together I didn't realize this festival, which isn't like a huge festival on world terms, but it's it's also a music festival. And it goes back to the 1980s. I didn't realize it'd been around for so it's long. It's been around for 27 years, and it's in Austin, Texas. Texas is the spirit of the American West, also the bastion of right wing conservatism. And you know, you'll only get my gun from my dead cold hands. But Austin, Texas, is which is actually <laughs> thinking about seceding from Texas. It is so uber hip. It's a very cultural place. <laughs> it's just. A, you know, great universities there, and not only home to some of the most influential music legends in rock and roll history, but also the biggest music and technology festival, and that's South by Southwest. It's a 10-day event, and it's, uh, I'm telling you, Phil, it's a, it's a veritable jambalaya of music, film, comedy, food, and all the technology that applies to all these mediums and is, uh, you know, movers and shakers that are making it all happen. So it's it's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, this year it was marred by some tragic events. Some uh, guy who was trying to outrun uh, or trying to evade a, a police barricade to stop drunk drivers ran a barricade and ran into a crowd of people and killed two and injured 23. The shock was, uh, was enough to mar the, this great event. But also the festival organizers and some people are trying to think, have we outgrown Austin? Has this festival become Come too big for its own good, so they're trying to re-examine that. There is some false knee-jerk reaction going on in the press that this uh, gentleman who was behind the wheel, he's a 21-year-old Rashad Owens, was a disgruntled hip-hop artist fueling the stereotyping of a, the angry gangster rapper, but he was not. He had a long history of 
arrests and convictions for a number of offences. Tragic from that point of view. Secondly, they also had Lady Gaga uh, opening it, I think, this year, which would be uh, equally as tragic, I would have thought. Uh, oh, but- come on. She's <laughs> nice. She's, she's <laughs> she is, great. Yeah, I, she really is. So I, go, I, I swing from uh, wondering whether she's got talent or not. And I think generally when you see uh, some of her songs I hate, but then when you see her sitting down at the piano and playing the acoustic versions, I mean, she really can sing. So, yeah, it was a throwaway, throwaway comment. But just on, in terms of the numbers, um, I mean, the numbers of people who go there compared to, for example, example nebworth in the in the uk which is a massive festival i mean this is it's big but it's not as big as nebworth so people are saying it's getting is it getting too big look at music festivals around the world it's still pretty small scale it's not necessarily a music festival music is just one part of it there are a lot of movie people down there you know new movies coming out the digital movie technology the technology industry and the techies that have to do with creating music in a digital format and also there's a big food part of this whole thing so it's it's one of those palooza deals where it's a real mishmash of everything. You mentioned Lady Gaga. Who else is there? Well, everybody who goes to this is anybody who wants to be famous, will be famous, is famous, or used to be famous. So that's why it's such an important thing. Sounds like something to go to. At the, uh, you know, in a couple of years, maybe it'll be held in the People's Republic of Austin. Uh, well, wait and see. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. <laughs> it's a good Richard place. Gossip, I mean, of all the places in Texas, it is uh, San Antonio and Austin are, are two of the greatest places in the, in the American West. They're just really good places. Some of the people that, that have come out of Austin, Texas, one of my favorite guitarists, a guy named Eric Johnson, is mm. out of there. Edgar and Johnny Winter were from Austin, Texas. Joe Ely, a lot of people are out of there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. And uh, in the 80s, probably giving away too much information about my, my life here, but in the 80s, backpacking around uh, Europe, I think I kissed, I think that's as far. Who went? I kissed a girl from Austin, Texas, as well. So uh, lucky you. Know, you. Yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, she. I think I was. I think she must have been drunk at the time, or on drugs. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, good to talk. See you next week. All right, Phil. Balls Radio with Phil Dobby.